The views expressed on this episode of My Take Radio do not reflect the views, thoughts, or feelings of the My Take Radio staff, My Take Radio advertisers, or My Take Radio content partners. Listener and viewer discretion is advised. This coverage is live and uncensored, so if you have any small children present, you may want to have them leave the room. What's up, guys? My Take Radio, episode 367, powered by RageWorks, broadcasting live on Wednesday, September 21st, 2016. I'm your host, Rich, and our call-in number is 347-324-3541. Again, that call-in number, 347-324-3541. If this is your first time tuning into My Take Radio, My Take Radio is a variety show covering mixed martial arts, professional wrestling, gaming, and entertainment. On Wednesday nights, we tackle MMA and wrestling at 11.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 8.30 p.m. Pacific. Thursday nights, we shift gears, jump into some gaming and entertainment stuff. Sometimes we get a little tech stuff in there as well. Same start time, 11.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. There are a couple of ways you can listen to tonight's show. Of course, you can head over to mtrlive.com and watch the video feed and also the high-quality audio feed provided by Mixler. In addition to that, the video is being simulcast to, through Restream to stream up Vaughn Live, Twitch, and YouTube Live. Audio is streaming, as I said, through the Mixler app, which you can download for your iOS or Android device. Just punch in Mixler, and you can download the app, put in My Take Radio, and you'll be able to listen to the live show. In addition to that, you can listen to live broadcasts of Black is the New Black, which also airs live on Mixler. The archived episode of this show and any of our past shows can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio in audio format. And a video version is available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash official rage works. All right. So before we get into tonight's topics, a couple of housekeeping matters to get out of the way. Uh, first and foremost, the biggest thing, of course, is that we are quickly approaching episode 400. A lot of people have been asking what I'm going to do for our 400th episode. You know, we still got a, a ways to go, but I'm trying to come up with something special. I mean, there's a couple of things on deck that I want to kind of address, but, you know, it, it's nice to see that we are rapidly approaching episode 400. The other thing I did want to mention is I've been seeing a lot more uh, increased interaction on a lot of our audio stuff want to thank everybody who is downloading the show sharing it and recommending it to other people we see the numbers going up and we really do appreciate it and it's not just for my take radio this also applies to uh, TRSS of course call me when it's over black is the new black all those shows are doing tremendous numbers a lot of great impact from all of my fellow colleagues in addition to that been seeing a lot of great traffic on rageworks.net want to thank all of you that have been checking out our content sharing our content and um you know just fueling the machine so to speak uh one of the things that we're going to try and do more of obviously is uh you know some unique content like toys and tech of the trade which has been really popular especially uh recently we had tony polanco on who is part of the coalition uh, really cool dude, really glad to have him on board. Uh, the goal is, and it's something that I've been trying to do and we've been trying to stick to it, sometimes it's just harder than others, is that we want to keep that, um, you know, we want to keep that column as our Friday thing. 
You know, it's one of those things where, um, you know, it, it's it's tough, especially when we don't have people for the column, and that's why one of the reasons why I ask uh, some of the people that we feature to nominate others because it allows us to reach out to those people and learn about their work, get on their radar, and share their stuff with you guys. But as always, I know that the end game is going to be a weekly column, but that's also dependent on people that are on board for that column. Now, we do pretty much have a couple of people that have been approached already that are going to be featured in future installments of the column, so be on the lookout for that. I know a lot of you guys have mentioned that there's been a bit of a drought when it comes to guests on MTR. Uh, three reasons why that is. Uh, number one is because, you know, just trying to get everyone for our 11.30 start time is not the easiest thing in the world. I know we got a couple of interviews on deck which are going to be recorded for MTR Behind the Mic and MTR Beyond the Mic, which obviously is going to be audio only. But nonetheless, we are definitely trying to make sure that we get some guest book booked for future episodes. But as always, you know, our airtime is is a factor and also just trying to get those particular guests and pin them down. Uh, there's a couple of wrestlers on the radar that we've reached out to, a couple of fighters that we're going to try and have on in the coming months. But it's one of those things where if you have your own show or your own site, you know that it's not it's not an easy one, two, three affair, and we're definitely working on it. Uh, for those of you that have asked about uh, iHeartRadio and Spotify, still in progress. Again, no updates, but when we do it, when we do pull the trigger officially, you'll see the announcement on RageWorks.net as usual. I know that JVB came on board and his Anything podcast and talking about games. Uh, both of those are going to be uh, joining the RageWorks network. It's just a matter of getting it, getting into a system to get the shows up as he records them and that's something that we're ironing out i know that some of the people saw the you know some of you guys saw the anything podcast that we posted which is one of uh, jvb shows but we're also working on getting tag on there as well and once that's done you know we'll be able to work it out i mean you know the tag and pgr crew they definitely know their shit and i think a lot of you guys that are fans of what we do will appreciate what those guys have to offer of course you can look them up on iTunes as well and check them out. Uh, in addition to that, the only other announcement I did want to make is there might be some scheduling uh, adjustments for the month of October as we're going to be doing the Photo Plus Expo and a couple of other things. And there may, all, obviously, once we get into October, I'll have updates with regards to the November broadcast schedule, but we're definitely trying to uh, outline everything in advance so that everybody is aware of what we're doing. So there is that. Last but not least, uh, social media. Thank you to all the people that have been following us on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. Definitely a lot of people on Snapchat. I've been slacking in that department, but we're going to try and do more snaps on a consistent basis. And uh, Facebook Live, we're still working on it. Uh, we found one one provider that we could probably do it with, but it's not 100% yet, but once we iron that out, then you're going to start seeing some really cool stuff with Facebook Live. All right. So, of course, we got lots on deck for tonight. We got some recaps from this past weekend's MMA action from the UFC and from Bellator, which had a pretty surprising card. We're going to get into the Raw before Clash of Champions, which... Uh, it's just it's just some stuff in WWE that we're going to really get into. Um, SmackDown Live, of course, the wrestling news of the week. And as always, your calls, 347-324-3541 uh, are the digits if you want to participate. And, of course, if you prefer to participate with your keyboard, head over to mtrlive.com. we got a chat room set up there, and you can participate and interact with me that way. And I will, of course, read your responses and questions on air i did want to mention once again for those of you that are watching our streams on youtube live twitch stream up vaughn live any of those other video providers if you can head over to mtrlive.com to participate in the chat only because we haven't pinned down a way to access all those chat rooms at once and i feel that a lot of the people in those particular on those particular services are being left out of the conversation but i do have to mention it in any case let's jump into some MMA, shall we? All 
So this past weekend, we had a Bellator show, which was Bellator 161, and we had an Ultimate Fight Night. Now, Bellator gets a bum rap sometimes for picking up a lot of the UFC's cast-offs, and sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, depending on the fighter, and obviously Bellator does a lot of freak show stuff too, but they have been delivering some really solid cards, and I got to say, Bellator 161 was no exception. The main event... Um, was Czech Congo taking on Tony Johnson. Also on that card, uh, Joe Warren, baddest man on the planet. Uh, the MMA equivalent of Ronda Rousey or Paige Van Zandt that they're trying to create for Bellator. Anastasia Yankova competed as well. Plus, Derek Campos took on uh, Dijamil Chan. And I want to go through some of the fights as usual. I... Um, I enjoyed it. I think Bellator is getting into their own. They really do have a lot of talented guys, and there are certain individuals that they've brought over who are um, who don't get enough credit. I mean, Czech Congo, a lot of people aren't a fan of Czech Congo. He gets a bum rap. Some people say he's a dirty fighter, and um, I, don't, I don't agree with that assessment. I mean, you know, are his, tactic, are his tactics questionable? Sure. I think that he has questionable tactics, and he definitely has pulled off a couple of uh, questionable actions in the cage but overall as a fighter he's pretty solid man he does a good job in there um he was in the main event uh, in the main event against tony johnson looked really good check congo definitely pushed the pace um against johnson who i thought showed some incredible potential against the uh former ufc heavyweight standout i was impressed with congo's performance i think that's a guy that has the potential to be a champion in bellator and i was a big fan of of the way that he fought that fight, real intelligent, uh, which is one thing that I feel Czech Congo is uh, very cerebral and on top of his game. Uh, the Joe Warren uh, Saran Kai fight, uh, Saran Kakai fight was ridiculous. Uh, Joe Warren again, a guy that a lot of people feel, you know, his MMA career is winding down, and he's one of those guys that he'll come in there and he'll shock you like that. It's um. Really impressive the way he he executed the guillotine choke on Sirwan Kakai, and it was it was crazy. The transition was quick, and he tapped him immediately in the third round. I mean, there was some really good exchanges in the first two rounds, but to see him catch him in that guillotine choke was pretty fucking awesome. Now, as I said before, Anastasia Yankova had a lot of press going into this fight. She was a kickboxer primarily. This was going to be. I believe her MMA debut. So of course, you know, she's attractive, very pretty girl, and you know, that that became the focal point leading up to her Bellator debut. You know, do they have, does Bellator have their own Paige Van Zandt or Ronda Rousey, you know, all the usual fluff pieces that are put out to to build a hype machine. And don't misunderstand, um like I said, very attractive girl, very marketable, but she definitely can go in there and and deliver an ass whooping if ne if necessary. Now her opponent, uh, Viva Vita Ortega, was really aggressive in in the beginning of, of the of the fight, and I think that was because I feel that Yankova had some adjustments she had to deal with, you know, in terms of just transitioning from uh, kickboxing to MMA and just you know a lot of the a lot of the jitters, and I felt that she was battling that throughout the earlier part of the fight and then as the fight started picking up she really got comfortable with her surroundings and you just started to see some of that Muay Thai technique on display some some great teeps some great front kicks um, really crisp striking in, in some of the exchanges even though Ortega was the aggressor Yankova definitely started holding her own and a lot of people were upset because Yankova took the fight via unanimous decision um, let me rephrase uh, that's incorrect. She took the fight via split decision. And for me, as I watch the fight, I understand you want to get Yankova on on people's radar. But I got to say, if, you, if you're watching that fight initially and, and, and I asked you, hey, what do you think of that fight? You would probably say that she lost because she took a lot of punishment. It wasn't until, you know, later on that she started, like I said, picking up steam. But I definitely felt that uh, the first round, definitely to Ortega. The second round could have gone either way, but I think Ortega definitely could have inched out that round. And then, as I said, Yankova took it took it to her in the third round. Uh, Campos and Dejamil Chan was a good opener. Um, Campos took the victory via unanimous decision. It was, like I said, a solid opener for 
for Bellator. And I think that Bellator is just starting to really gain gain their footing. I think that Scott Coker is is he's he's doing a, a better job than Bjorn Rebney was with the organization. And I think they're trying to sign a lot of good fighters. One fighter in particular who joined the roster I'll be addressing later on in the segment. But um it was it was a good night of fights from Bellator. So definitely props to those guys. Of course, uh the UFC at UFC Fight Night ninety four which was it was all right. It was pretty, pretty paint by the numbers card. Which um, again, not terrible, but in, in a in a situation where you're seeing MMA almost every weekend or every other weekend, the card did get lost in the shuffle. But there were some noteworthy happenings. Uh, Derek Brunson ranked number ten, dispatching Uriah Hall in highlight reel fashion. It was it was a crazy fight. Uh, Derek Brunson is is a guy that you definitely can't write off, and Uriah Hall always, you know, everybody always talks about his highlight reel knockout on the Ultimate Fighter and his amazing kicks. And what ended up happening was that, you know, Brunson there was an exchange. He hit him with a left, and he floored him. It was it was a it was a really really vicious finish. Um, you know, a lot of people aren't weren't a fan of the way Derek Brunson was carrying himself into the fight. Um, but I feel Uriah Hall was definitely out. He, I, I don't feel he had the wherewithal to intelligently defend himself. Um, you know, you could you could watch the the replay for yourself and the highlights, but I just I just don't feel that was the case. Uh, the main event was Michael Menace Johnson taking on Dustin Poirier, and um, you know that fight there was there was some really really strong. Uh, emotion at the weigh-ins, like like you know, definitely a lot of psychology at play. And Michael Johnson, holy shit, with a beautiful, beautiful counter right hook, murder death kill Dustin Poirier. Poirier hits the hits the mat, and it was it was vicious. It was a truly vicious knockout. Uh, to went down in the first minute and a half of the uh, of round one. Uh, really strong performance by Michael Johnson, a guy who you know comes out of the Ultimate Fighter. Has had he's had a bit of a bell curve. He's had some highs and some lows uh, in his career, but that was definitely a highlight reel finish and a good way to cap off a, a pretty decent card, albeit one that a lot of people just didn't really give a shit about. Which is unfortunate because I thought that most of the fights were okay, but I just wanted to acknowledge those more than anything else. As for the bonuses that were handed out, of course. Not shocked. Uh, Michael Johnson got a performance bonus. Evan Dunham and Rick Glenn's fight got fight of the night, which yeah, I kind of feel was could go either way. But I, I felt that the fight was engaging enough that you know it could have warranted the fifty thousand. Uh, Chaz Skelly also took a fifty thousand dollar bonus. So uh, nice payday for those guys. And like I said, a pretty decent card overall. Now, as I mentioned about the UFC NY card or UFC 205, depending how you want to look at it. Um, you know, the, the buildup for this fight card has been tremendous. As a New Yorker, obviously, I'm tremendously excited, but I also know that some of the fights that the UFC has been trying to put together haven't really been setting uh, the world on fire. The original fight that I was really excited for was going to be Donald Cerrone, Robbie Lawler, which I mentioned last week Lawler had to withdraw. And... Um, Donald Cerrone is now going to be facing a very, very dangerous Kelvin Gastelum, which is uh, which is a solid opponent. I like Gastelum. I think he's come a long way. Again, another guy who's had a bit of a bell curve in terms of his success in the UFC. But stepping into fight, Donald Cerrone, uh, definitely solid for sure. There's also a huge rumor floating around that Eddie Alvarez will be fighting Conor McGregor. Um you know, Eddie Alvarez took to Twitter to call out Conor McGregor. Uh, Damon Martin from Fox Sports says that the card is, you know, the rumors have been swirling for weeks and that both fighters are on board to make things happen. Now, obviously, you know, Eddie Alvarez light, um, is the lightweight champion, uh, McGregor's champ at 145. Uh, curious to see if McGregor is going to try and go after that 155-pound strap. I'm a, little, I'm a little annoyed, as I've said before, because I feel that McGregor's needs to defend his belt, but I also understand that Dana White wants to get a huge fight on the New York card to to ensure that there's an amazing payday. So it, it's 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 good and bad. 
from a business stand from a business standpoint, I totally understand why you want to get McGregor on that card. I mean, there's a there's a there's a pretty big Irish contingent here in New York, in New York City, so I can see that. But I also think that you're you're continuing to feed the um, the McGregor ego to a point because I understand he puts asses in seats. He's had two record breaking fights with Nate Diaz, so. As much as people hate to admit it, he is in the driver's seat because he is the guy that is the draw, him and Nate Diaz in, in both of their outings. But like I said, from a business sense, I know that if you're going to make a, a, a show in the Mecca in Madison Square Garden, you can't, you can't put just any old fights in there. Also announced for UFC 205, Tyron Woodley putting up his welterweight title against Steven Wonderboy Thompson. Uh, these guys have been exchanging verbal jabs uh, since... Tyron won the belt. I think that's going to be a good fight. I think Wonder Boy has the technique to give Tyron Woodley a problem, but I also feel that Tyron Woodley comes in with an incredible amount of strength, both from his wrestling pedigree, but also from his stand-up. Uh, I think that he has the potential to really put a, a hurt on Wonder Boy. But I also feel that in terms of technique, Wonder Boy definitely is on another level. The fight could go either way for either guy. I think both guys have uh, the the capacity to deliver a highlight reel finish. I just feel that you know Tyron Woodley is going to be the guy that is going to try and push the pace with the wrestling, try and smother uh, Wonder Boy. Who, even though Wonder Boy is a big dude at 170, I think Tyron Woodley just looks like a bigger 170 pound fighter. Uh, we'll see what happens. I think that's a good title fight to have here in New York. I think having McGregor on the card, especially if Eddie Alvarez decides to put that 155-pound belt on the line, is huge. I mean, we all know McGregor's talked at, you know, a lot about trying to capture that belt. And, you know, I have no problem with it, again, being a champion in two weight classes or whatever. But I do feel, like I said before, that he needs to step up and defend that belt and cut the bullshit. So we'll see what happens, obviously, as more develops for the UFC 205 card. I will share it with you guys. Now, a fight that was announced recently, which I was a little, I really was a bit perplexed as to why this, this guy would be facing you know, his opponent. As many of you know, Ryan Hall uh, recently won the Ultimate Fighter, the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu ace, uh, has been under the radar. I just feel that the UFC hasn't done a lot with him which is odd because I understand he came in as an alternate, et cetera, et cetera. But Ryan Hall is, you know, one of the best Brazilian jiu-jitsu practitioners on the planet. And not allowing him to showcase that is crazy. But uh, it was announced that he was going to be facing Gray Maynard, according to the Las Vegas Review Journal. Uh, the featherweight fight is set for December 3rd uh, for the Tough 24 finale. Again, I don't. I don't dislike Gray Maynard. I just feel that Ryan Hall deserves a. You know, a, not a. I'm not saying that Gray Maynard's not a noteworthy opponent, but I just think an opponent that can really, um, you know, sell that fight. Because I, I, like I said, Gray Maynard is a talented fighter, a veteran. I just feel that you're taking a guy like Ryan Hall, who has, like I said, amazing jujitsu. You want to showcase him accordingly, and I think that Gray Maynard is going to try and really try and push the stand-up. Even though he has good wrestling, because obviously Ryan Hall can tap him out in his sleep. But um, we'll see what happens. Like I said, on paper, I'm not totally sold on that fight, but I am willing to give it a shot. A rematch that is on deck for later on this year is Fabricio Verdum and Cain Velasquez. All signs point to these two heavyweights squaring off at UFC 207. MMA Fighting did confirm that. Um, I'm, I'm actually looking forward to seeing that fight. I think that the previous outing where Verdum dismantled Cain uh, Velasquez was not... It, it just wasn't a, a good fight for Cain. I think coming off the injury, fighting in Mexico, uh, the change in training... I don't think it did him any favors. I think the the cane that we saw in, his, in the last fight, it was dialed in, is injury free, and I think is gonna go out there and get himself back in winning form. But Verdum is a warrior; he can take an ass kicking, uh, that's for sure. And I was curious to see how that fight would go down with Kane, 
you know, training in the States with a full camp and injury free. Really excited, hoping both guys stay healthy so that we can check out this rematch in December. <clears throat> it was a pretty big week for Bellator as they announced the signing of Westland's gangster, Chael Sonnen, uh, who now heads to Bellator, which was crazy. As many of you know, we were talking about Chael uh, going back into the USA, USADA testing pool and probably making a return to the UFC octagon. Don't know where it fell apart, but Bellator was happy to pick up the wrestling uh, psychopath from Westland, Oregon. I'm very excited to see Chael back in the spotlight, and of course, he brought his typical trash talking with him. I think in Bellator, there are a, a, a substantial amount of good fights for him. I do feel that uh, the inevitable collision course with Vanderlei Silva may happen. Uh, who knows? He may go into light heavyweight and fight Tito Ortiz or Rampage, which on paper are two fights that I would like to see, even though, you know, Rampage and Tito are older. I feel that, you know, Chael will bring some really good attention to either one of those two fights. But I'm excited to see Chael back in the cage. You know, everybody talks about Conor McGregor selling fights. That's one thing Chael is a master at. Um, you're talking to a guy that talked himself into a fight with John Jones at 205, even though he had barely competed at 205 on a consistent basis, and it still happened. Um, if anything, Chael is one of those guys, and I've said this before, he has exactly what Dave just said in the chat room. He has all the tools to be a, a pro wrestler, and I wouldn't be shocked if TNA tries to bring him in either to you know work some matches or be involved in the promotion. As I said, Chael is a showman, has all the tools, and is tailor-made for pro wrestling. Um, you know, Dave says in the chat room that he'd love to see Chael in WWE. I agree 100%. Like I said, Chael has the tools. He is one of a handful of guys that I feel would transition well to WWE. Uh, you know, Josh Barnett is a second in that regard, and I, you know, even even McGregor, McGregor would make a a pretty good addition to the to the, to a WWE roster if he, you know, put in the work, which you know, obviously you can't you can't take it away from. And I say this not in terms of physicality or or wrestling acumen, but I'm talking about showmanship and getting people invested in the product. And Josh Barnett, not so much. I think Josh Barnett just his catch wrestling. Um, and the way he presents himself is just, you know, he just screams pro wrestler. But a guy like Chael, he looks looks the part, talks a good talk, gets the job done in the cage, you know, whenever possible. And like I said, he's just he's just perfect in that capacity. We'll see what happens. You know, Bellator has a pretty decent relationship with TNA. And, you know, TNA is going through a, a very weird period right now, which we'll talk about during the wrestling segment. So... We'll see what happens. I know for a fact that Chael and Vanderlei, Chael versus Tito, and Chael versus Rampage or King Mo are four fights that I would definitely love to see uh, now that he is part of the Bellator roster. That's for damn sure. The, um, the other fight we got on deck, we got UFC Fight Night 95, which is crazy. Uh, Chris Cyborg facing Lena Landsberg. Chris Cyborg has to cut. I believe she's got to cut about 24, 25 pounds, which is crazy uh, in time for the fight this weekend. And from what I've been hearing, they don't want to give her the one pound overage. She has to come in at exactly 140. So um, we'll see what the deal is. Chris Cyborg main eventing this fight. Uh, the fight card looks pretty solid. I'll get into it later on in the segment. But uh, it's going to be a tough weight cut from what they're saying. She's got to cut... Um, According to what was said on the MMA Hour on Monday, she's got to cut 24 pounds by Friday. And that's just, that's just bad news. Definitely bad. Two MMA promotions that have been putting together some pretty solid cards on Access TV have announced a merger. That is Legacy FC and RFA will now be merging and will be now known as Legacy Fighting Alliance. So uh, two... Pretty solid independent promotions coming together to form one one umbrella promotion, which I think, you know, it's one of those instances where it's the UFC, Bellator, and everybody else. It's good to see that Legacy and RFA are coming together. I think both promotions have put on some really good fights. If you have Access TV, 
uh, through your cable provider. You can check out some of their cards. They've been really good. And to see them coming together, I think, is, is solid. That's for sure. Now, while we are on the subject of Access TV, it is with a, with a heavy heart that I announced that they are actually going to... It's the end of the line for Inside MMA, which has been the MMA talk show on the Access TV network uh, for the last few years. The last episode is scheduled to air on September 30th. Originally, it was Boss Rutten, Kenny Rice, and um, Kenny Rice stepped away, replaced by WWE's Mauro Ranallo. Him and uh, Boss Rutten have been holding it down. And I was, I was sad, you know, I was sad considering that that show's been on air for 10 years. Originally, they didn't even have a really good relationship with the UFC. So a lot of the stuff they talked about with regards to the UFC was always like still images. They couldn't get certain fighters. And then, you know, before you knew it, Inside MMA became the one of the premier MMA talk shows on cable television. And I think part of it is because of the great chemistry between Kenny Rice and Boss and then bringing in Amaro Ronaldo. It was, it was tremendous. I mean, and Ron Kruk doing a lot of the... Uh, man on the street stuff, covering a lot of the smaller MMA promotions, showing some really talented fighters that probably no one would have seen if it wasn't due to Inside MMA. I think it's you know it's 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 sad to see that it's the end of the line for that show. And you know, Access TV is still going to continue to do stuff. You know, Legacy Fighting Alliance shows are going to be on there as well as other cards, but. Um, you know, I'm sad to see a show like that disappear because it, it had so many great moments. It was great for the sport, and the the guys that were involved had really, really great chemistry. Of course, you know, the UFC has their, their stable of programming on Fox Sports 1. They have UFC Tonight and stuff like that. But I just felt that Inside MMA was, you know, being an independent entity, they were capable of just giving us a clearer narrative about what's going on in the sport without any sort of involvement from the UFC or any of these other promotions. Obviously, with the UFC being the rudder on their shows, they're going to probably, you know, they're going to dictate the direction of interviews and certain segments, et cetera, et cetera, as will Fox Sports versus Access, which kind of let uh, the Inside MMA crew just, you know, kind of do their own thing and deliver a show that many fans, including myself, really enjoyed. Uh, definitely you know, appreciative for the work those guys did for the last 10 years. Uh, I wish them luck. I think Boss Boss Rutten has all the tools to be an asset in any organization, either as a color commentator or a matchmaker. I, I mean, the guys, you know, his technical, his technical expertise on the sport, his appreciation for the sport, and just the fact that he's such a, such a badass dude, make him tailor-made for any promotion. Hopefully, you know, the UFC takes notice, brings him in maybe to do some work on Fox Sports, but um, I don't think we're going to be seeing, we're, we're going to see the last of El Guapo and Ron Kruk. So we'll see what happens, but I'll be tuning in September 30th to wish those guys Godspeed. Um, again, really, really bummed out when I heard that it was the end of the line for them. But we'll see what happens. Obviously, if uh, those guys go to other promotions or are involved in other stuff, I will let you guys know. The, um, as I said, before one of the things I, I mentioned last week was the departure of Joe Silva, which um, pretty much had matchmaking in the UFC up in the air. A lot of people thought that Sean Shelby was going to take over uh, since he does most of the fight matches, uh, all, most of the matchmaking for the lighter weight classes and the female weight classes. But looks like uh, Mick Maynard, who was from Legacy Fighting Championship, will be coming on board to take over for Joe Silva, who is stepping down in 2017. Uh, it hasn't been officially announced, but Flow Sports and The Score have both touched on the story. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what Maynard brings to the table, and we'll see what fights he can put together uh, and if he can do as good of a job as Joe Silva did. Uh, overall, I think uh, the week in MMA was pretty solid, albeit you know had some, some highs and lows. The, uh, the signing of Chael was tremendous. I think that that was probably one of the the coolest stories for me. And like I said, we had two really good fight cards. The Chris Cyborg card, I'll probably have picks for that on Instagram as usual. And um, who knows? We'll see what happens. We'll see if Cyborg gets herself another highlight reel finish. Because as a fan, I still want to see her and Ronda Rousey square off. That's for sure. 
even though all signs point to Ronda coming back and challenging Amanda Nunes, I still feel that Ronda and Cyborg is still a draw. All right. So with that, we are uh, putting the MMA segment to bed for this week. Pretty, pretty decent week overall. Let us switch gears and jump into some pro wrestling, shall we? Raw this week was, I, I just felt Raw was pretty uneventful. We got Clash of Champions this Sunday, and as I've always said, you know, the final televised program before a pay-per-view, or in this case, a special event, is supposed to be one that makes people want to order, want to tune in, want to see what's happening, and I just feel that ever since the brand split, WWE just... They've kind of phoned it in. I mean, they've had some spectacular episodes of Raw and SmackDown Live, but it's been very, very, very inconsistent. Uh, this week's episode of Raw had was no exception. They had some, some good moments. They had some bad moments. Um, we had the debut of the Cruiserweights, which was tremendous. If you haven't seen the Cruiserweight Classic and you have the WWE Network, please, please, please do so. Uh, the winner of that. Of course, TJ Perkins was awarded the new WWE Cruiserweight Championship, and he will be defending it at Clash of Champions. They had a number one contenders match on Raw with um, the Brian Kendrick, Cedric Alexander, Rich Swan, and Grand Metalik. Um, four, four really solid superstars that were brought up to to showcase the Cruiserweight division. I I, I almost felt that it was either going to be Grand Metalik or Brian Kendrick when the match started. I like Cedric Alexander. I like Rich Swan, But I think those two guys are, you know, they definitely have the tools and they have all the potential to be stars. But I think they wanted to go with uh, somebody who was a little bit more established in the veteran Brian Kendrick. And I think he's going to definitely take the fight to TJ Perkins. Do I think he's going to take the belt from him? I don't believe so. But I think Brian Kendrick has all the tools to be a great villain in the cruiserweight division, and that was definitely one of the the high points for Raw this week. But in terms of you know the bad, I gotta say um, this shit with Braun Strowman is getting tiresome. the The setup for Sami Zayn and Kofi and Big E and and all those guys taking on Jericho, Primo Epico, and and you know Gallows and Anderson was fucking it. It was so out of control and so it was. Like, I understand you want to try and get it together and you want to set it up, but it just feels so disjointed on top of the fact that as much as I like Enzo and Big Cass, their shtick is getting stale. It was really, really stale this week. And and I've said it before. I don't know if it's because you got creative directing Enzo's promos more versus the stuff he was doing in NXT, but I just feel it was really, really fucking tiresome. Um, in addition, I'm not I'm not completely sold on what they're doing with Primo and Epico. I think as wrestlers, they're really good. I just feel that what they're doing with the with the timeshare shit, and it's not even because I'm Puerto Rican. I don't even give a shit. I just feel that they their characters are just lost out there against guys like you know Enzo, Kaz, the New Day. It just it just felt lost, you know. And I understand you're trying to build up Jericho and Zayn, and and that's cool. But the buildup and, you know, all the fucking back and forth just, it didn't work. And it was definitely one of the, you know, one of the low points, one of the bad moments. Uh, also, not a fan of Bo Dallas. I don't give a shit about Bo leaving Bo, making him more aggressive. The guy fucking sucks. He really does. It is, it, it, I don't give a shit what you do. It, you know, you can, you can fucking... You can paint shit gold and it's still shit. And that's pretty much Bo Dallas. It's it's one of those things where, and I've said it before, I, I think Bo Dallas needs to be aligned with Bray Wyatt. By himself, garbage. He really is. Like he, I understand you're trying to make him aggressive. It just doesn't look believable. And as for Braun Strowman, I, I, I see what they're doing. 
Uh, Sin Cara continues to get a little bit more offense every week. It's not great, but I understand in terms of if I had to weigh out the bigger long-term potential between Braun Strowman and Bo Dallas, I would put all my money on Braun Strowman any day of the week over Bo Dallas because Bo Dallas, just he just doesn't work. I don't understand all the fanfare about him in NXT. He was good in NXT, don't get me wrong. But on the main roster, he is piss fucking poor. He's one of those guys that if I had to do any, excuse me, if I had to do a trade with SmackDown, I would send him to SmackDown, bring Eric Rowan to Raw, put Rowan and Harper together to 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 you know to build up the tag team ranks, and send you know Bo Dallas to to SmackDown, and maybe just do a program where he's trying to tell Bray Wyatt that him and Bray are brothers. And that, you know, they gave him away. Do something, you know? Because I just feel that that's... It, it would have at least been a better moment. I also feel that for all the work that they're doing with the women's division, I felt that the exchange between Charlotte, Dana Brooke, and Mick Foley was probably one of the uglier moments of the night. I also, you know, Dana Brooke, you're talking about this chick, she's jacked. And Charlotte's just fucking sunning her every week, pushing her around, clowning her. It just it looks it looks foolish, and I thought it was just very very disjointed. As for Cesaro and Sheamus's best of seven series, we all saw it a mile away that it was going to go seven. The matches themselves continue to be good. That's one thing uh, you know that I I'm never concerned when Cesaro's involved, and he's made Sheamus look good. I think that their seventh match, which of course is going to be contested at Night of Champions, is going to be. It's going to be one of those sleeper matches that is going to be incredibly good. I really hope that the payoff is a championship opportunity for Cesaro. I'd love to see a Cesaro and Kevin Owens program. I think that those two guys would would have stellar, stellar matches. Kevin Owens could do a lot of the talking, and Cesaro could hold it down in terms of the microphone. Um, but, you know, let Kevin Owens carry the bag and then just let them go out there and wrestle. You know, considering everything that we saw this week, it was, like I said, Raw was rather subpar, which is a shame because it's the Raw that's supposed to convince us to tune into Clash of Champions on Sunday, and it definitely did not do a good job. That's for damn sure. On the flip side, SmackDown Live was actually a decent show. Not as not not leaps and bounds better than Raw, but we did have some really, really good matches. I got to say that the that the villainous Usos taking on American Alpha was probably one of the better matches between those two teams. I like what they're doing with the Usos every week. Subtle changes, you know, the entrance video, the way they dress, uh, the fronts that, that they're wearing, uh, the way that they're carrying themselves, even the stuff that they do. If you watch the WWE Snapchat channel, some of the ways that they're interacting now were really, really good. Uh, definitely, again, uh, one of their uh, really good outing, great psychology, and I know where this is going. It's going the Usos probably getting the straps off of uh, Rhino and Slater, and then obviously having the match with American Alpha and American Alpha capturing the gold. I am I'm really I'm really hyped with the way that they're building up the Usos. I like the psychology. I I was really impressed with the way they took out Chad Gable's knee in that match. Like really good psychology, and it just again. It's, it's the little things. Think about it. Gable comes back from the knee injury. They spent the entire match working the knee, working the knee, working the knee. And that's, that's what I'm saying. And I liked the, uh, the high drama. I like when Jason Jordan was like, I'm not going to tag you in, Chad. You know, you're too hurt. And, and that was really good storytelling. I just felt that everything about that match was running on all cylinders. But for every good moment, there was a bad. And I'm tired of, Baron, of Apollo Crews being jobbed out every week honestly if we had to talk about trading superstars i would trade apollo cruz to raw for you know bo dallas and i would also trade kalisto to raw for sincara only because kalisto is 100 percent necessary for the cruiserweight division i would bring sincara over to smackdown maybe have him challenge for some of those other titles you know sincara is a bigger wrestler and I think he would do well on the SmackDown brand. But Kalisto, you need him for the Cruiserweight division. Why they did that, you know, still boggles my mind. Um, 
I also got to talk about Naomi and Nikki Bella's match with Carmella and Natalia. What an ugly, ugly, ugly match. Again, we are seeing that Carmella is not ready. Not ready in the least. Also, ugly. Randy Orton and Eric Rowan. Fuck that match. That match was a dumpster fire of shit. I was like, all right, already. Like, Eric Rowan, he's a big dude. He moves like a robot. He, he, he sucks. He genuinely sucks. And he has a cool look. You know, he's a big dude. He looks kind of creepy. But his movement, I don't know. It, it just it really, really sucked. It was, it was definitely one of the ugly moments. Also, I got to say that the match between The Miz and Dolph Ziggler was fucking tremendous. It, there, was, there was a spark there. I, I'm watching it. And it's just one of those moments where, and I've said this on previous episodes of MTR, there are certain guys that have certain opponents that just bring something special out of them. And the Miz and Dolph Ziggler have that chemistry. It reminds me of the old rivalry between The Rock and Triple H in the old days. Like that type of a rivalry that those guys, they're going to continue to feud for years to come. I was, you know, I was, I was really, really pumped with it. Uh, Handel says that that match started slowly and it was awful at first. You know what it was? I understood the story they were trying to tell. And while it did have a slower pace, I respected where it was going because, you know, The Miz is going to be methodical. He's going to be a chicken shit heel. He's going to be the guy that's going to cheat to win. It's all part of the character. But I'm also hearing the rumblings that, they're prob that The Miz may head to Raw with the IC title and they may bring Rusev over to SmackDown, which honestly, I think Rusev would be a better fit on SmackDown only because there's fresher opponents there for him. Um, you know, I, ju I just feel that that would work better for me personally versus, Ke like, on Raw, I kind of feel that the U.S. title doesn't get any love, partially because, you know, they're, they're clearly going to put it on Roman, but if they didn't put it on Roman, I would definitely move... Rusev with the U.S. with the uh, IC title. Uh, let me Rusev with the U.S. title to SmackDown and Miz with the IC title to Raw. Uh, Dave says Miz needs to hold that belt for a long time. You know, I always look at the way that they're trying to do Miz's title reign, and I think of the Honky Tonk Man and the way that they book the Honky Tonk Man's title reign. And you can do that with the Miz. As much as people dislike him, I can, I can see that working for some reason, but. I just feel that on SmackDown, unless he's wrestling Dolph Ziggler or you're allowing The Miz to show a little bit more uh, of his wrestling ability, he just feels lost in the shuffle. Uh, that's all I'm saying. Uh, Dean Ambrose faced John Cena in a match that was pretty good. I, when Dean Ambrose got the clean pin, I said to myself, did the referee fuck up and accidentally give the pin to Ambrose? But... Uh, you know, once AJ Styles came out and delivered the phenomenal forearm and all that stuff, obviously it was intentional. But they did a good job. I like that Cena went over. and You know, I mean, that Ambrose went over on Cena. I think Ambrose, even though he had a, a pretty, you know, lackluster title reign, I think that he has, you know, he has the, he has the capacity to be, to be a special talent on SmackDown. And I think working with John Cena is going to be good for him. I liked... Him going over clean because it validates his character. It also kind of makes you wonder where John Cena is in in the whole thing. You know, I liked I like the storytelling that's going on there. Going into their their next pay per view, the SmackDown pay per view, and the triple threat match between them, I really want them to keep that belt on AJ. As much as I like Ambrose, I really don't want to see John Cena get the belt back yet, and. Um, I would prefer that Ambrose, you know, continues to evolve his character and become a guy that doesn't need the belt to be a power player. Uh, you know, David, David in the chat room mentions Ambrose on Talking Smack was gold, and I agree. And that's exactly what I'm really liking about the Talking Smack after show, that we're starting to see some really, really special moments, some really awesome breakout moments for superstars that we didn't think were 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 on the verge of those moments. You know, the uh the the Stone Cold style promo that he cut on Talking Smack was tremendous and David said it they're turning him into Austin 2.0. I I can agree with that and I feel that that's good, but I also have to say that 
as much as they're trying to capture, recapture, you know, Roman as the Rock, Ambrose as Austin, you got to remember that these guys are their own individuals. You cannot replicate those superstars. As much as you want to, you have to let them borrow elements of those superstars, but you have to allow them to remain themselves. One of the things that makes Rollins such a great, compelling character is that he's a sniveling, conniving motherfucker. But when it's time to go in there and, and put together a five-star match, that guy comes in and he turns it on to another level. And that's one of the things that has made Rollins so interesting because it's like he's one part HBK, you know, to a point, but then he's moving around and flying around like a cruiserweight. And the villainy that he brings to the table is tremendous. And I, we all know that they're grooming him and moving him in, into being a face. And I have no problem with that because, honestly, I think that Seth Rollins as a face would probably be extremely marketable considering that him and Kevin Owens have the potential to have a very, very long-standing rivalry. But again, like I said, take advantage of these guys and the stuff that they bring to the table but allow them to remain themselves. You know, allow them to be special. And I just feel, I just feel that with, with Ambrose, Ambrose has all the tools, man. If you look up John Moxley on YouTube and you watch some of his old promos, Slick, if, if, if you can, just throw up like the best of John Moxley or a John Moxley promo in the chat for people that, that come in later on and can check it out. I think that Ambrose's promo work we're only scratching the surface. We definitely have not seen some of the real textbook stuff that Ambrose is capable of. Anyway, with that said, let me uh, shift gears a little bit, get into the other wrestling news of the week. Um, on the TNA side of things, things have been getting very, very interesting. Um, as many of you know, Billy Corrigan from the Smashing Pumpkins, yes, that Billy Corrigan, has become not only the on-air head of talent but he is also essentially the head of tna behind the scenes and it's been floating around quite a bit that he is trying to get some investors to buy tna and and own tna outright um as many of you know tna has kind of been in a in a very very interesting uh situation when it comes to ownership and money dixie carter at this point kind of has been effectively quietly pushed out the door i mean she's an on-air character but in terms of the day-to-day -day, uh you know billy corrigan is has assumed a lot of those duties now the the goal that billy corrigan has is that he would obviously like to have investors and buy tna and run tna his way but in an interesting piece that was put out by the new york post it seems that he is not the only person interested in purchasing tna uh, one of the people that have put in a bid for TNA is Sinclair Broadcasting, who many of you know is the parent company of Ring of Honor, which, considering how good Ring of Honor has been lately, um, you know, grabbing some of the TNA talent and integrating them into the Ring of Honor roster is something that would be incredibly, incredibly interesting to see. But the only problem with that is guys like Moose, Mike Bennett, who left Ring of Honor to go to TNA, they would either have to go back to the company they left or obviously try and, and get on WWE's radar and go to NXT or SmackDown or Raw. But the other crazy thing is that WWE allegedly put in a bid for TNA. Now, of course, it's all rumors and speculation, but the New York Post, Dave Meltzer, a lot of, a lot of different sites have been kind of fueling that speculation and i gotta i gotta acknowledge it and i wanted to take a bit of a deep dive i gotta say wwe acquiring tna is being done for one purpose and one purpose only and it is for the tna tape library and i'll tell you guys why wwe now has samoa joe bobby Roode, eric young aj styles all tna guys all guys that have that have fine-tune their craft at TNA. And by grabbing that TNA tape library, you essentially have a lot of those really, really great moments. Like, especially for a guy like AJ Styles, if you look at some of AJ Styles' career-defining moments, he had a ton of them in TNA. A ton. 
People talk about some of the stuff later on when he kind of became like the, the, the motorcycle jacket wearing dude. But even before then, he had amazing matches with Kurt Angle, amazing matches with, you know, all the X Division guys, Christopher Daniels, Frankie Kazarian, Samoa Joe, the list goes on and on. There's, there's a tremendous upside for WWE if they grab the tape library. Now, in terms of superstars that WWE can acquire, it's very interesting for a couple of reasons. You obviously got guys like Mike Bennett, uh, EC3, who's you know pretty much become a household name at this point, uh, Bobby Lashley, who's still marketable. There's, um, there's a lot of guys that definitely would benefit from being in WWE, whether it be in NXT or Raw or SmackDown. And I wanted to break that down a little bit because even though a lot of people shit on TNA, TNA still has some pretty good standout characters on their roster. Even though I can't stand him, Eli Drake, is he has something. He has an it factor that definitely gets people's attention. Gail Kim, we know, will never be back in the WWE, which is unfortunate because considering the, the current prominence that the women's division is in, I would love to see, you know, I would love to see Gail Kim mix it up with, you know, Sasha Banks and these ladies. Um, Mike Bennett and Maria Kanellis definitely would benefit from an NXT run or even a SmackDown run. I like Mike Bennett. I think he has uh, a really nice bit of douchiness that he brings to the table that would work well on a bigger platform. Bobby Lashley has grown quite a bit as a performer. He's become a, uh, a, a, better, a better wrestler than he's been in quite some time. He's starting to really get comfortable in his own skin with his promo work. I, I wouldn't mind seeing Bobby Lashley come back. You could make him, you know, your, your, your Brock Lesnar type dude for SmackDown. I mean, Lesnar's already on Raw. Maybe do something bigger with Lashley on SmackDown. Uh, he definitely has the tools. James Storm, we know... Um, from what I've heard from a countless other sites and read on countless other uh, publications, uh, is no longer with TNA. Does that mean we'll see James Storm back in NXT and on WWE TV? That remains to be seen. If I had to take anybody else from from TNA off the uh, off the rip, I gotta say Abyss is a tremendous big man. Uh, would be a great asset, especially because he can move very well. Uh, he's good for the for the some of the more violent stuff and. He's just a, a unique character that you could do some stuff with. I mean, I know people aren't totally fans of his, but I think, you know, he definitely has an upside. I also like uh, Rockstar Spud for the Cruiserweight division. Uh, he would be a great addition. Uh, DJ Z, I think, would be tremendous. Um, David says, beer money, please. I would like to see glorious, glorious beer. How about glorious beer, Dave? What do you think? <laughs> glorious beer the tag team of glorious beer would be tremendous unless uh, you know obviously if you buy tna you get beer money but uh glor glorious beer that's all i'm saying um who else from tna i mean obviously the hardys the hardys would would be picked up immediately and probably go into the hall of fame uh broken matt hardy is such a such a crazy character that he would he would probably get a, a bit of a resurgence. I mean, watching SmackDown, I was hearing delete chants. I was hearing obsolete chants on, on SmackDown television. So clearly the Hardy stuff is over. Like I said, EC3, definitely. Drew Galloway, you know, they, they dropped the ball with Galloway. He's doing really well in TNA. I wouldn't bring him back to WWE. I'd probably let him go to Ring of Honor or New Japan. Same thing with Sandow. I would probably do that. They didn't do Final Deletion Part 2 slick. They did uh, Delete versus Decay, which is a faction on TNA, you know, on the TNA roster. It's Abyss, Crazy Steve, and Rosemary. It definitely was just about as crazy as the Final Deletion. Uh, you can find it on YouTube and check it out. I believe TNA actually posted uh, Delete versus Decay, the director's cut. So look for that on YouTube if you want to check it out. But um, I'm, I'm interested. I'm interested in this acquisition. I'm interested in seeing what they do and if WWE pulls the plug. I mean, if they do, you know they're going to probably fold TNA immediately, grab a couple of those contracts, and get the tape library. But Sinclair, on the other hand, may, may grab a lot of those guys and bring them into Ring of Honor. 
Uh, it's going to be a very interesting time. And of course, as more develops, I will keep you guys posted. As many of you know, Shelton Benjamin was scheduled to come back to SmackDown. He underwent surgery on September 7th to repair his torn rotator cuff, and he is expected to be out of action roughly six months. What that means in terms of Shelton Benjamin's SmackDown re-debut remains to be seen, but I really would like to see Shelton Benjamin back on TV. I think he's, he, he's going to be a great addition, and, um, you know, We'll see what happens. Obviously, six months is a long time, but I will keep you guys updated with that. Now, this next bit of news I was really intrigued about. With the recent success of the Cruiserweight Classic and what that's done for the WWE, there has been talk of them doing a women's tournament in 2017 in the same style as the Cruiserweight Classic. And I've said this before, there is a lot of female talent out there that just hasn't been properly showcased. And I think doing a, a women's tournament would be tremendous. I think that it would be great to not only fill the, ra the roster for uh, NXT, but for WWE and SmackDown. Like, I can talk about, you know, Tessa Blanchard, Santana Garrett, uh, Havoc, um, what's her name? Thea Trinidad, uh, Angelina Love, Velvet Sky. Whether you love them or hate them, uh, you know, those are all great additions. Uh, I got to say uh, Jade from TNA, if, if, if obviously the TNA stuff goes the way that many of us are hoping. There's a lot of great talent out there. There's um, obviously Ivalice from Lucha Underground, which they're never, they're never going to give her up because Ivalice is, is amazing on Lucha Underground. But still, in, in a tournament, a great character to have. Um, Taya Valkyrie, another great character who is currently on the Lucha Underground roster. There, there are so many great characters there and so many great female wrestlers. If you go to Shimmer and you see some of the characters there, I want to say uh, uh, Nikki Savo, uh, also Shayna Baszler, who obviously trains with Ronda Rousey and is now embarking on a career in pro wrestling. Uh, you could grab her. Um... You know, House of Glory has has some great female talent there. Sonya Strong uh, stands out as a solid talent. I mean, do I think she has the tools to be ready for the big time? Maybe not, but still, a, a, ta a good talent none, nonetheless. Uh, David mentioned Taylor Hendricks from Ring of Honor. I agree. Uh, Mandy Leone from Ming Ring of Honor. Uh, Mandy Leone from Ring of Honor. Another great example. Vita Scott from Ring of Honor. Also another another young lady that you could you could involve in that there's so many there's so many great female performers out there that I would be I would be really really pumped to see a female tournament so I'm really hoping that this rumor becomes truth uh, for 2017 especially with the great job really great job the WWE did with the cruiserweight classic I definitely would love to see it so we'll see what happens I will definitely keep you guys posted with regards to that now there were some nxt tapings recently i don't want to spoil too much but there is going to be an announcement for the return of the dusty Rhodes tag team classic be on the lookout for that um definitely something to look forward to i felt that the tag team classic uh initially that they did was really well done so seeing that happening once again is going to be very cool to see play out on nxt on the TNA side of things, they announced on TMZ that Brandy Rhodes, wife of Cody Rhodes, has signed with Impact Wrestling. Many people have been saying, and there's been a lot of speculation, that Cody Rhodes would be joining her and joining the TNA roster. Now, Cody Rhodes, from what I've heard, would, be ha would have a special contract that would obviously let him compete in TNA, but also let him do some independent stuff as well. I think that if Cody Rhodes heads to TNA... He is going to be a great addition to the roster. And if they're not acquired by WWE and Billy Corrigan um, gets the, the money to, to buy TNA outright, building it around guys like I said, like Aaron Rex, EC3, Cody Rhodes, um, you know, Bobby Lashley. There's definitely Michael Bennett, uh, Moose. There's, there's potential there, that's for sure. But like I said, Brandy Rhodes is official according to TMZ, and I'm sure... The inevitable arrival of Cody Rhodes is going to happen sooner 
rather than later. Last bit of news to wrap things up. As we know, Clash of Champions is on deck this weekend. We got um, some really good matches for that card. I think that overall we're going to see, for the most part, I think that most of the titles I think are going to change hands. I have a feeling that Charlotte's going to probably drop the belt to Sasha Banks, uh, but since that was something that was slowed down by injury, and they're probably going to start building a Sasha Banks and Bailey program. At least that's where I see it going. Um, in terms of the the championship, the Universal Championship, I feel that they have they have a couple of options. Obviously, there's always the rumor of Triple H getting involved, which whatever you you know, I doubt it, but it is possible. I really want them to leave the belt on Kevin Owens. I think Kevin Owens has the tools for that. Um, Rollins, I think Rollins and his his uh, face, his gradual face turn needs a little bit more work. And obviously the inevitable collision course with Triple H is a factor, but I'd love for Kevin Owens to retain, and I am picking him to retain on Sunday. Uh, Sami Zayn and Chris Jericho, I think Chris Jericho is going to continue putting over young talent Sami Zayn is going to go over with Rusev and Roman. I think we're going to get a new U.S. champion in Roman Reigns. Cesaro is going to win the best of seven. Um, Nia Jax is going to kill Alicia Fox dead. And there's a part of me that thinks that they're going to give the tag team titles to Gallows and Anderson. I don't know why, because I think that the New Day are going to continue to to be you know a staple in the tag team division, but I think they're going to try and put the, those titles on Gallows and Anderson. Do I think it's going to be a clean victory? Absolutely not, but I think they may. there may be a title change on the tag team side of things on Sunday. Um, TJ Perkins and Brian Kendrick, I don't really think that after all the work that TJ Perkins did, you're going to take the Cruiserweight title away from him, but you're also going to probably have one of the best matches of the night between him and Brian Kendrick. If they give them about 10 or 12 minutes, you're going to see something special. Um, overall, I think Night of Champions on paper looks like it's going to be a, a big hit this Sunday, but it all boils down to the wrestling. So, as I said, Nia Jax, Murder, Death, Kill, Alicia Fox, Kevin Owens is going over Rollins, Gallows and Anderson are going to get the tag team titles, I think Sasha is going to get the belt back, Sami Zayn is going to get put over by Chris Jericho, we're going to get a new champion in Roman Reigns. Cesaro's going to win the best of seven, and TJ Perkins is going to retain at Night of Champions. All right. The only other thing I did want to address is, um, for those of you that have been curious about Summer Rae, Summer Rae is dealing with some injuries. Um, you know, I thought that with the new renewed uh, women's division, we would be seeing Summer Rae, and I thought maybe, I figured she was hurt, but I heard that she's hurt quite a bit and is dealing with a couple of different injuries. So, you know, last time we saw her on TV was mid-August, and even though I clown Prissy Hen quite a bit, I don't like to see anybody injured, and um, it seems that she's, she's going to be meeting with doctors in October, but she has been dealing with uh, quite a bit of injuries. So for those of you that are curious about where Summer Rae is, she is on the injured list. Um... John Cena is also scheduled to be taking some time off to film the next season of American Grit. Uh, it's probably looking like you're not going to see John Cena uh, throughout most of October, but he'll probably be back for Survivor Series. If not, he'll probably be back for some of the, the WWE events in December. But yes, John Cena is going to take some time off. So that continues to fuel what I said before, that AJ will probably keep the belt and Cena will probably take some time off, maybe from a crazy attack by Ambrose that'll put Cena on the shelf. And obviously at that point, Cena will come back to work a program with Ambrose. All right. So with that, that is actually going to put to bed uh, the wrestling segment for this week. With that, I've given you guys my take on MMA and wrestling this week. As always, I would love to hear yours couple of ways you can do that feel free to become a fan of rageworks on facebook facebook.com forward slash official rageworks 
You can also join the Rageworks group to talk wrestling, MMA, gaming, entertainment, pop culture, comics, toys, whatever, with the rest of our staff and, of course, our listeners and readers. Just look for Rageworks on Facebook, and you can see the group. Join it and get in on the conversation. If you're on Twitter, you can find us either at MyTakeRadio or at Rage underscore Works. Rageworks is also on Instagram at Rageworks, also on Snapchat as well. Uh, we're trying to definitely do more snaps, do more behind-the-scenes stuff, trying to also do more Instagram stories, but you can look for Rageworks there. We're also on Pinterest and Google+. Plus. If you use either of those platforms, we put stuff there as well. This episode, as well as many of our previous episodes, can be found on Rageworks.net. Go to Podcasts, Punch in My Take Radio, and you can see all our shows there, both audio and video formats. If you are an iOS user, you can find My Take Radio on iTunes. You can also find us on Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, and very soon iHeartRadio, Spotify, and Google Play as well. You can also take the RSS feed from RageWorks.net, dump it into the podcatcher of choice, and you can get audio versions of the show that way. Video will be available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash official RageWorks. Within the next 24 to 48 hours, of the airing of this show you can look for video there and of course if you haven't please subscribe we put up countless things between unboxings product reviews gaming footage event coverage you name it we're doing it rageworks definitely your destination on youtube for that and of course make sure to check out the channels for our staff jvb uh j santi trss and of course our very own slick whose channels you can find linked to our official RageWorks channel on YouTube. All right, guys. Thank you guys for tuning in. Join us later today, now that it's Thursday, for the gaming and entertainment edition of My Take Radio, starting live at 11.30 p.m. Eastern, 8.30 p.m. Pacific. All right, guys. I'm out of here. Thank you guys for tuning in. See you guys later. Peace. Uh, uh. That's all, folks. <laughs>